Coffee's gone. It's missed. Aha. In my new birthday mug. Thank you to my mother-in-law. Ooh. It's electronic. It keeps my coffee at 138 degrees, just how I like it. I didn't know that until I got the mug. It told me that was a good temperature, but Revelation chapter 8. We might knock out the whole chapter or a verse. The Lord knows. So, morning, Sandy and Lisa and Susan and Dad and all the rest of y'all. Let's see here. Do, 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 do. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. So you could think of this as kind of the calm before the storm. Uh, that many of the judgments up until this point, uh, and it's crazy because we were reading about a quarter of the earth being killed, but now it's supposed to get worse. And the bowl judgments are even worse than the trumpet judgments. So there's this calm before the storm, that awkward silence. And I saw the seven angels who were standing before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now, you can take this and just do whatever you want with it. A little bit of a, of a contradiction, but both our theories are, are possible. Um, the Jews had a tradition of seven archangels. I have them written down because I'm not memorizing this. Uriel, Raphael, Ragiel, Michael, Serakel, Gabriel, Remiel. The seven archangels. That, that was in tradition, a uh, Jewish rabbinical tradition that was around in Jesus's time. Uh, but on the flip side, in the Bible, uh, Michael has a definite article before his name. Michael the archangel. And so for what it's worth, quite often when we see definite articles, it's usually speaking of one and only, uh, the one and only archangel. Some have had a, a hypothesis that Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer were three archangels. And when Lucifer fell, that he drew a third of the stars with him, as we'll read in a few chapters, so that a third of the, of the angels followed Satan, and maybe it was the third that he was in charge over. We don't really know. We don't really know. But that's, you know, information that we can piece together and try and, you know, make with it what we can. Verse 3, it says, Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with, or in addition to, the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar, uh, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Now, so the seventh seal opens all this stuff up. And, um, you know, a friend and I were talking recently just about literal interpretation and what's symbolic and what's literal. And so here's something that's good to remember is that as we look at a literal interpretation and really trying to take things at face value and only seeing things as symbolic, typically when it says they're symbolic, because sometimes it says, here's what I saw and that was this. Something to remember is that we're in heaven right now in our in our account, we're getting an account from John in heaven. And John is seeing things in the spirit realm. And so, interesting to imagine that what John is seeing is from heaven's perspective. When John sees this, uh, the, the fire, it says, D -d 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 -d, I lost my spot. He took the censer, filled it with fire, and threw it to the earth. So again... This is what heaven is seeing. What will we see on the earth? What we're going to see are these trumpet judgments coming out. But in heaven, I think there's things going on in the spirit realm we don't see. But watching from heaven, this is what it looks like. In heaven, they see horsemen released, right? I mean, I could back up to chapter 6 
Number two is just right here in chapter six, verse three. When I when he opened the second seal, I heard the second creature living say, "Come and see." Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to him uh, to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And so, I think there's a seal, a scroll. I think John watches a seal come off that scroll, and then over yonder he hears the voice. And he watches as this horse takes off down to earth. Down on earth, no one's seeing a horse. But they're seeing the peace be taken from the world and all that other stuff break out. So again, we're seeing this back and forth. What is being seen in the spirit side of things, in the spiritual dimension, and then what's being seen in the earthly dimension. So here we start seeing the trumpet judgments. And I'll give you guys some good cross-references as we move forward. It says in verse 7, the first angel sounded and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the grass was burned up. Now, we're seeing this hail and fire come down. Joel 2.30 says, blood and fire, pillars of smoke. Uh, in the seventh plague on Egypt in Exodus 9.24, we see hail mixed with fire. And there, um, let's see here. And you'll notice that it says, and all the green grass is burned up. Ah, there's going to be more green grass later. But that's also because grass grows. Uh, we're going to find things. So the third and the third. So things are all going down. Okay? I'm trying to quickly read my notes as I'm moving along here. And so now, verse 8, Revelation 8.8, 8, we have another trumpet. And this one is the angel sounded and something like a, like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures of the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. What we're going to see in the trumpet judgments is many things come down and destroy a third. Now we talked back uh, when we were in chapter 6 about how a quarter of the earth will be killed and how one quarter of the earth's population could be right? North America, all of it. South America, all of it. Uh, Australia, all of it. And pretty much all of Europe. Now, will it kill just these places and no one else elsewhere? That's not what I'm assuming. But I believe with a third of the earth being destroyed, we're going to see, I believe, Western Hemisphere taken out. Personal opinion. Because to set up the scene at the end of the book of Revelation where people are gathering around Israel, rebuilding going on in Babylon, a battle that takes place at Jerusalem and in the valley of Armageddon out there in the Jezreel Valley. For all these things to take place, it just makes sense that humanity is returning to the cradle of civilization. Humanity is returning to the epicenter of God's creation, back to Israel and the Middle East. And so I believe much of this destruction will actually be destroying North and South America and pushing people out of the Western Hemisphere and back into Eurasia and Africa. And I think God will continue to take out the extremities, pushing and forcing people back to one central location for that one final battle. It just makes sense. Militarily, it does. And so then we have, um, and so a great mountain, it's just a large comet. It makes sense. What does a guy like John, who's never watched TV, he's never seen National Geographic, he's never been on the internet, when he sees a large comet, a huge comet coming down, it's just like a big mountain on fire coming to the earth. Some people see nuclear bombs. Some people see modern warfare being described. I don't know. I, I could see that. I lean more to the just big fiery mountain out of the sky, sounds like a comet. And so then we see in uh, verse, we did the mount, okay, 10. Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven like a burning torch, and fell on a third of the rivers and on a third of the spring waters. And the name of the star was Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Interesting is that in the Ukrainian language, this word here, wormwood, is Chernobyl. Uh, people like to cling on to that. Um, could this be nuclear fallout? It's possible. But also, again, we see supernatural. 
one reason why I personally have no problem with other interpretations, but why I don't lean to nuclear warfare in this tribulation period is because I don't like rationalizing God's supernatural things. The History Channel does a great job of ruining the Bible again and again and again. And, uh, oh, hi, Heather. Good morning and happy Friday to you. I watched that thing where they went through and they explained the plagues of Egypt and how it could be scientifically explained and how, well, if there was a, a big tidal wave coming, it would draw the water away long enough that the people could cross over. There was like a million people. Ain't no million people crossing over as a tidal wave is on the way, right? I mean, there's all these different things that they were trying to, they were trying to justify, well, well, if there was a certain kind of bacteria or plague, and then see the firstborns were always given double portions, and that's why all the firstborn children died, you know, in the plague of Egypt. Rather than rationalize it, the angel of death came and he killed the firstborn anywhere where he did not see the blood of the lamb applied to the door. Done. God parted the Red Sea so that they walked across as if on dry land. And so this wormwood thing, it's interesting because in Exodus 15, we see the bitter waters of Mara and God takes a piece of wood and he sticks it in the water and he makes it good. Here, in theory, is a piece of wood, wormwood, right? And it makes all the waters bitter. And so does God rain down something from heaven that just makes all the waters poisonous on a third of the earth? Once again, he, he's, he's taking out everything in this one section. Uh, I do think it's an isolated third, and I would think it would make sense, again, to push people over to the Middle East. So those who were alive in America would be fleeing and heading over to Europe and trying to get into where there's civilization. And then finally, the fourth angel sounded in verse 12. And a third of the sun was struck and a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of them were darkened and a third of the day uh, did not shine and likewise the night. And I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because the remaining blasts of the trumpet and of the three angels who are about to sound. So, here we have the sounding from heaven. You know, it tells us in, in the next few chapters, there will be angels flying through the sky and they will be proclaiming the gospel. They will be preaching the everlasting gospel from the skies. And it's during that time, when we get up to chapter 13 and whatnot, where the mark of the beast will be offered as well. And it's a reminder that this time of the tribulation, I, I believe it's an important dispensation. It's an important time period where God will interact with mankind unlike he ever has before. And I believe once we get past that midpoint of the tribulation, people will be without excuse. There's angels in the sky preaching the gospel. Hellfire and brimstone are falling. And you're going to watch as a huge number of people will take the mark of the beast. And in doing so, what they're going to do is willingly and knowingly say, screw you, God. I'm going with him. Sorry if that's bold. But that's what it is. That's the idea. No, no, no. Th at this point, they're not going to be confused about what they're doing. And they're not going to accidentally do it. It's going to be a very bold, in-your-face stand against God. And so it's just a reminder for us today and for our friends that some people say, well, if this, then I'd believe. If that, then I'd believe. Well, yeah, this, but this. And everyone has their logical reasons, but by this point in the tribulation, God is going to prove logic goes out the door. Sinners just want to sin sometimes, and there's nothing that will ever change their minds. And so while there's been a period of amazing grace and, and the giving of God's Holy Spirit through the church age, here's a series of seven years where when it's over and man stands before God at the, at the judgment seat, at the white throne judgment, and people say, well, God, why didn't you do this? 
then God's going to say, you know what? I did. You wanted rules? Man, I made a great list of rules. People mess those rules up. You want me to go easier? I went easy. I gave grace upon grace upon grace. Was I too easy? Well, I came down hard for those seven years. You know, it's a, a really just a small blip of time compared to all of creation, you know. And so God can say, no, I, I tried the heavy-handed approach. And mankind, much of mankind, still chose to do their own thing. And so I do believe that at the very end of time, God can show, I tried every way of relating to mankind, reaching out to mankind, and shepherding mankind. And yet there was always a group who would receive me and there was always a group who would choose to reject me. And so explains a little bit of the heaviness of the book of Revelation and, and what's going to happen during those seven years. So there's chapter eight in the bag. And tomorrow we move on to chapter nine and we'll continue those trumpet judgments. God bless you guys. Have an amazing day. Um, hopefully that wasn't all a downer. Because it's just a reminder that we share the gospel and people are going to receive it or they're going to reject it. And we'll do what we can. So, amen, Enrique. In the millennium, he'll rule with an iron rod. No time to expand on that for today, though. But we will get there and we'll talk about the millennium soon. Have a great day, guys. Take care.